Gentlemen, Rob O'Neill. So we are talking about cultivating our souls, that we're trying to get an abundant life for, our, for what God has to unpack in our lives. We're talking about tools for cultivating our souls. But here's the thing, those tools really unleash. Am I not on? Put the switch on the top of the green light. All right. Check, check, check. You didn't need it. We heard you. That's fine. Start, start all over again. Sorry to interrupt you. Pull out those yellow things that you've got. I want to talk to you about three mechanisms that help us to cultivate our souls. We're, you, we're talking about tools. We're giving you a set of tools. But each of these tools unleash a mechanism that God has for us. So if you want to write down three things, there are three fundamental commands that God gives to us. And you could write them down uh, on the left-hand side. You'd write down, love God, first command that he gives us. You, you probably know this like the back of your hand. Command number one is love God. Command number two is love others. Command number three is make disciples. Jesus adds that command during his ministry. Each one of those commands comes along with a mechanism. As we try to love God, God gives us the Holy Spirit to help us follow Jesus, to cultivate our souls and to give us spiritual nourishment and spiritual growth. Loving God, God gives us the Holy Spirit to help us follow Jesus. As he's commanded us to love others, he gives us each other. And the presence of other followers of Jesus in our lives helps us to follow Jesus ourselves. It cultivates our soul. Command number three, make disciples. He gives us the ability to help other people follow Jesus, which fascinatingly cultivates our own souls as we help others to follow Jesus, producing an abundant life in us. So three mechanisms. As we love God, the Holy Spirit helps us follow Jesus. As we love each other, we help each other follow Jesus. And as we make disciples, that actually helps us to follow Jesus. But if you think about it, these three mechanisms attached to these three commands really work kind of like the feet on this stand right here. If you were to take one or two of these feet away, the stand wouldn't be stable. And sometimes we think of cultivating our souls as purely a learning of loving God and unleashing the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as we're thinking about cultivating our souls, that's like asking the stand to make it with just one foot when God has given us three mechanisms, three feet on which our spiritual lives stand. Our spiritual lives don't purely stand on loving God and unleashing the Holy Spirit in our lives. They also stand on being helped to follow Jesus by other followers of Jesus and being helped in our following of Jesus by seeing other people come to follow Jesus. And soul friendships, it's a little bit odd term possibly for you, is all about unleashing that second mechanism. Soul friendships unleash the second mechanism of cultivating our souls, and that's that other followers of Jesus help us. Because the soul friendship is having a, a conversation with someone about spiritual matters, about following Jesus. That's what it is. It's being able to have a conversation with another follower of Jesus about following Jesus. Sometimes we do it in small groups. Sometimes we do it in, in very small disciple-oriented groups of maybe three people. Sometimes we do it with an accountability partner. Sometimes we have this conversation simply with one other friend. But soul friendships are the process of unleashing the second mechanism <coughs> of cultivating our souls. Now, we've already talked about some problems that keep us from doing things and cultivating our souls. And I want to identify three of them that really, I think, uh, stop us from building soul friendships. The first Terry already talked with you about is it. time. We say we don't have enough time. And, and we all know it's not that we don't have enough time, it's that we make decisions about how to spend our time and we make decisions to spend our time on other things. Second mechanism or second problem that keeps us from building soul friendships is the whole issue of transparency. Here's, here's something that you can take to the bank. We're all crazy. We're all broken. I hope this doesn't come as news to you, but that means you too. You're crazy. You're broken. And very few of us like to be transparent and honest 
about that fact. We like to keep the mask up and look like we're okay. Why? Because we are afraid to show people the truth that we're crazy, that we're broken, and that we are in need of soul friendships. <coughs> but not only that, talking actually comes difficult to us, particularly as men. Uh, as, as men, it comes very difficult for us to talk about things that matter, which is why we talk incessantly about sports and weather. Those are the two permitted topics for us as guys. Why? Because we're not great at talking. So if we were talking about the place where you work, or if we were talking about the teams that you coach in sports, and someone came to you and said, you know, I, I don't have enough time to prepare, and I'm kind of afraid, and I'm lacking skill. You would not at work say, oh, well, well done, keep doing that. Nor would you, if you were coaching a sports team, say, okay, well, you get a participation medal anyway. No, it wouldn't be good enough. You'd say you can do better. And as followers of Jesus, as men, we can do better when it comes to soul friendships. We need to build soul friendships. What do they look like? Soul friendships, first of all, are intentional. I have the blessing of being a part of a small group and... We started getting together about eight years ago now when our, t when our children were becoming teenagers. And the first few months, almost a year that we were together, was very polite, very helpful. We did some Bible study. We read some books together. About a year in, we started opening up about the fact that raising teenagers was a challenge to us. We started showing that there was something more than the mask and, and the facade. We started admitting the fact that we were crazy. And the amazing thing is that as one person would say, I'm crazy, I'm broken, everyone else in the group would say, oh, that's such a relief because I'm crazy and I'm broken too. And we recognized in beginning to raise teenagers that we would not be able to get through raising teenagers as followers of Jesus without each other. And so we made a covenant with one another and we decided to support one another in following Jesus. That was the intentionality. We decided to support one another in following Jesus as we were raising teenagers and it's a fantastic thing we did because I have to tell you, so shortly after that we had a teenager diagnosed with, with uh, juvenile diabetes. In, in our group we've had children involved in rebellion, we've had uh, people come down with Alzheimer's, we've had heart attacks, we've had cancer, we've had tremendous brokenness in the group that I'm a part of, my small group, one of the groups that is a soul friendship for me. And I'm so glad that at the beginning of all that, we decided to help each other follow Jesus. Now the, the fact that soul friendships are intentional is one of the things that's difficult for me because I like to relax. Being intentional and deciding that I'm going to help another person follow Jesus takes energy, it takes effort, it takes thought on my part, and I reach a point in the day where I just want to relax. I just want to golf. I just want to fish. I just want to watch football with a friend. Taking the time and the intentionality to help another person follow Jesus is sometimes a struggle for me, but I'll tell you this, it doesn't have to be difficult. One of the most helpful questions I've ever found one of the most helpful practices I've ever found is asking a simple question, what's God doing in your life? When you ask that question, it, it, first of all, that question is beautiful because it's, it's so simple and it's so low risk. You just ask another person what's God doing in, in your life and, and the ball is with them. They tell whatever story, they share whatever thing they want to share, the ball is with them. But it's also such a high return type of question to ask. Because it's amazing how sometimes people will be honest with you. And when you ask them what's God doing in your life, and they're honest, the conversation gets real immediately, and you've built a soul friendship. You've had a conversation about following Jesus, and it's gotten real. Soul friendships are intentional, but soul friendships are also directional. If you have ever been a part of a meeting that did not have an agenda, you know how painful that can be. When you go into a meeting with no agenda, the conversation wanders, everybody gets frustrated, everyone feels like their time is being wasted, you just can't wait for it to be over. Friendships can wander, relationships can wander in much the same way that meetings can wander, and that's absolutely not what we want. We actually want in our relationships to have a plan. We want soul friendships to be directional. We want a plan. And our plan for soul friendships begins with deciding what is a disciple of Jesus? What does a disciple look like? What does a disciple do? And how can I help you get there? 
So we want soul friendships to be intentional, and we want them to be directional. And I want to leave you with one challenge, a very simple challenge. That is talk with someone. Look, this stuff can transform our lives. There's one verse from the Bible that I want to share with you. Actually, you don't know it, but I've shared about 10 verses. And if you need the footnotes, come and see me later already. But this one verse, which is actually backed up by chapters and books, 2 Timothy 4.21. 2 Timothy 4.21. The reason I, I, I'm going to cite that verse, I'll tell you what it says in just a minute, is because it, it talks about the relationship that Paul the Apostle had with Timothy, a soul friendship. And if you go back to Acts chapter 16, you can see where this friendship began. Paul, in his second missionary journey, comes through uh, the city of, of Lystra, and he finds a young man who had become a follower of Jesus there, Timothy. And, and Timothy showed potential. Such potential that he's known all the way over in Iconium, the big city in the area. The other followers of Jesus knew him as a growing potential leader. Paul took Timothy with him. He poured his life into him. He became a soul friend to Timothy. He gave him opportunities to lead, opportunities to follow Jesus, and Timothy grew. And, and the Bible seems to indicate that Timothy became every bit the leader that Paul was, every bit the follower of Jesus that Paul, his mentor, was. 2 Timothy 4.21 Paul is probably sitting in jail, probably in Rome, expecting to face a trial that would probably lead to the end of his life. And in that moment, and as he wrote 2 Timothy, the last of the letters that we seem to have that Paul wrote to Timothy, he's talking about some silly stuff. He says, pick up a cloak and some books that I left over here. And those people, they're, they're busting my chops. And these people, they're good people. <laughs> but then he says to him in 2 Timothy 4.21, do your best to come before winter. Paul had, had gone from just being a mentor, a boss, pouring into his young protege, to be a friend. And, and it was that friend that he longed to have with him as he faced the end of his life. Because now Timothy was helping him to follow Jesus as well. I have a mentor, he's been my mentor for nearly 20 years now. And one of his roles in my life is to shape me from being a pastor that just cares about building a church to being a follower of Jesus, who cares passionately about multiplying followers of Jesus. That's, that's my role in, in life now. And my mentor, Denley Coffey, is responsible for that change in my life. He has poured into me, he's been my sole friend. He asks me hard questions, but he is my friend. He, he's my dear friend, we've been good friends for 20 years now. He is in Marion, South Carolina, experiencing Hurricane Florence as we speak. And he's not just my mentor, he's my friend. My thoughts and my prayers are with him today because our relationship has changed over 20 years. From being purely a, an older, more advanced guy building into a younger guy, to being two friends who love each other, who help each other, and who follow Jesus together. My thoughts and prayers are with Denley and his wife Anne today. Talk with someone. Build a soul friendship. Get the conversation going. Be intentional. Be directional. And unleash God's second mechanism for cultivating our souls.